From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The House January 6 inquiry holds a hearing with an aide to White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. But did her testimony increase the legal jeopardy for President Trump or his advisors? Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We're joined today by my colleagues, columnist Kim Strassel and editorial writer Mene Ukwe Barua. Welcome to you both. The January 6th committee was not scheduled to hold a hearing this week, but it did so anyway at a last minute scheduling, and it called Cassidy Hutchinson, who was described as the principal aide to former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. And the biggest news item to my eye out of this hearing seems to be that she testified that before President Trump's speech on January 6th at the Ellipse, she was backstage and she overheard conversations about people informing the president that some of the people uh, in the crowd who were not going through security, not going through the magnetometers, if I said that word correctly, were armed. And here was the president's reaction, according to Ms. Hutchinson. But when we were in the offstage announced tent, I was part of a conversation. I was in the I was in the vicinity of a conversation where I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. Let the people in. Take the effing mags away. And Kim, as we've discussed, this committee is not an adversarial process. We don't have full transcripts of these interviews that it's doing. But Cassidy Hutchinson worked for the White House. She's a former intern for Ted Cruz. She's speaking under oath. And some of this testimony is hearsay, but here's a conversation that she says she directly overheard. And if that's true, it certainly makes President Trump's speech, his call to march to the Capitol, look in retrospect more reckless than it even did at the time. Well, and we know it was reckless. This, if it is true, would seem to put more emphasis on that and also suggest he was very, very angry that day. There were a few other things that she talked about in terms of having been present in and in around him on January 6th. It suggested that he was a lot more upset about everything that was going on and frustrated over the way things were going to likely to turn out, given that Mike Pence was not going to go the way he had wanted him to than we had previously known. One issue with this is, I mean, and I have no reason to doubt her, but it's hard to know sometimes how to take some of this testimony because, as you say, there is no adversarial process here, no one to ask her some tough questions and to see if we're getting the whole thing. I mean, one thing that I found just kind of that sat odd about this story, I have to be honest, is it strikes me as weird that the president's security detail and all the folks around him would just casually walk in and inform him that there are people out in the crowd that were armed in a place, by the way, where that would be illegal because it's Washington, D.C., and that the Secret Service would nonetheless just let him walk out there to give a speech. That would seem to also raise some interesting questions. But I think in a way, too, this also highlights, again, the frustration of this committee and the way it's happening and how I wish that there was some deeper questioning all around. One of the other pieces of news out of this this was Trump's reaction to the crowd's chance of hang Mike Pence after Mike Pence refused to try to throw out electoral votes or to delay the counting of the electoral votes. And this is particularly interesting, I think, because in its opening hearing, the January 6th committee had previously cited some of these quotes without sourcing them. But here is what Ms. Hutchinson testified that she overheard, and this is White House counsel Pat Cipollone. Uh, speaking to Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. To which Pat said something, this is effing crazy. We need to be doing something more. And the other part of the difficulty here is that there are at least two people who could shed light on the actual details of that conversation. They would be Pat Cipollone 
and Mark Meadows Manet, but both of them, at least so far, have declined to testify to the committee. So uh, instead, the committee is trying to figure out what's going on by speaking to people like Mark Meadows' aides. That's exactly right. I think Mark Meadows uh, declined early on to testify before the committee, citing the executive privilege that surrounds President Trump, but also most of his senior staff. He was held in contempt by the committee. But it does look like Merrick Garland has declined to prosecute him in a way that would actually force Meadows to come forward and testify in front of the committee. So that would give us definite answers to a lot of these questions that Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony has raised. And it is possible that we'll get that. I actually saw that Mick Mulvaney mentioned just on Twitter that he thought that Meadows would now feel the urge to come forward and basically clear up all this doubt that's been cast on the role that he played in these situations, despite being reluctant before. So we might still see that. But yeah, it just is another component of what has been a theme of this committee, which is sort of an incomplete picture. I think that in as much as what is coming from Hutchinson and some of the other people who have testified is true, it does shed a terrible light on sort of Trump's inaction in moving to prevent the a rally from getting under control and for how determined he was to basically endorse the fraud narrative and encourage people who were sort of rallying around him. But we just don't know what's true. And there are too many players still on the sidelines for us to have a complete picture of what happened. And to the point again about the adversarial committee and what it could have provided, there was another piece of testimony on Tuesday. Ms. Hutchinson says that President Trump wanted to go to the Capitol after his speech And when she got back to the White House, she was told by a deputy White House chief of staff that President Trump got into the presidential limousine and was told they were going back to the White House and he made a grab at the steering wheel. And there's some suggestion floating around in the news media that the Secret Service may deny that this happened. And I haven't seen a statement from them yet. President Trump denies that it happens. He said her fake story that I tried to grab the steering wheel of the White House limousine in order to steer it to the Capitol building is sick and fraudulent, very much like the unselect committee itself. He also said, and this is his post on Truth Social, he also said, I hardly know who this person, Cassidy Hutchinson, is, other than I heard very negative things about her, a total phony and leaker. And when she requested to go with certain others of the team to Florida after my having served a full term in office, I personally turned her request down. Why did she want to go with us if she felt we were so terrible? And so, Kim, I mean, here's a place where it would certainly be nice if the committee would do its work in a way that would allow some better testing of these claims before they are made public. Yeah, well, and let's see if the Secret Service does issue a statement on that. It would certainly be, if it did, a kind of undermine the credibility of some of this testimony if they said that it was wrong. Now, she did say that this was relayed to her from someone else. That raises all kinds of other questions about using hearsay in these proceedings, but we'll just have to see what actually happens here. It would certainly be notable if Donald Trump had insisted or wanted to go to the Capitol. I think that that's an interesting question to be raised because that would have dramatically increased the pressure and stoked the situation as people were walking down there. You could also argue that there are some sort of real rules about this. You know, presidents don't just get to show up at the Capitol anytime they want. It's a separate branch of government where there's all kinds of formalities when they do come to attend. So that would be a very rash and unprecedented decision. But we'll see what the Secret Service has to say. Two other things I would point to as potential points of vulnerability for Team Trump here and also lines of inquiry for the committee. One is that according to Ms. Hutchinson, she was under the belief that President Trump the day before the riot told Mark Meadows to call Roger Stone and she doesn't know what they talked about. She said she was under the impression that that call was completed. But that is a potential issue because Roger Stone was photographed with members of the Oath Keepers, this group that helped storm the Capitol. And so there's a potential line there. And then also the committee at the end of its hearing raised the issue of potential pressure on some of the witnesses and says that they commonly ask witnesses if they've been contacted by anyone before their testimony. And here's one quote they provided. Someone 
let me know you have your deposition tomorrow. He wants me to let you know that he's thinking about you. He knows you're loyal and you're going to do the right thing when you go in for your deposition. And so I don't know. I mean, again, this is a quote that is coming from someone whose name we don't know. And the person who allegedly told the testifier this, we don't know the name of that person either. And we just have this snippet of a quote. I don't know what the exact legal standard for witness tampering or pressuring a witness is. But, Manet, it did seem like the committee was showing its cards a little bit that they intend to pursue that angle. Right. I mean, it was a big step for them to go ahead and release the text of those text messages If they are authentic, and I think we can, you know, give the presumption that they are, they are not a very good look for the Trump team, as you mentioned. They do reflect the possibility that someone close to President Trump was leaning on someone who was going to come before the committee in a private testimony and trying to make sure that they wouldn't say anything incriminating. Of course, that isn't in itself evidence that there was any wrongdoing. You could imagine Trump thinks, hey, this is a witch hunt. They're trying to get everyone they possibly can, some of whom sort of have ill will towards Trump at this point, to say something that they could use or spin into a charge. So just trying to make sure that you're on the same page with a potential witness doesn't necessarily indicate tampering, but sort of all things equal, it doesn't look very good. But again, it would be extremely helpful for the public to know who those texts came from and in what context, and hopefully we'll get future testimony that substantiates it a little bit more. On the question of Roger Stone, I think that's a little bit more circumstantial. Don't get me wrong, it obviously doesn't look good either uh, to have someone who we know was in touch with the Oath Keepers potentially getting a call from President Trump uh, shortly before the January 6th rally. But, you know, President Trump and Roger Stone uh, are longtime associates. They could have been discussing any number of things. So even if the call did take place, which we're not sure it did, that doesn't necessarily point to Trump being aware of the rally's plan to invade the Capitol or being in any way sort of involved with executing that. Hang tight. We'll be right back. You're listening to Potomac Watch from The Wall Street Journal. From the opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Kim, let's talk about the audiences for this hearing. And to my mind, it looks like there are two of them. And one of them is Attorney General Merrick Garland. The committee seems to be split about the idea of making a criminal referral for anybody at the end of its process. Last week, the chairman, Benny Thompson, seem to suggest that he doesn't think making criminal referrals is part of Congress's job. He said, we're going to tell the facts. If the Department of Justice looks at it and assume there's something that needs further review, I'm sure they'll do it. Merrick Garland has said he's watching the hearings, but other members of the committee have pushed back and said that they do think if the committee finds it's warranted, it should make a criminal referral. I mean, do you think the evidence that it is presenting so far is raising the political pressure, at least, on the attorney general to do something. Without a doubt, which I also think is really unfortunate. And this debate among committee members well precedes any of these hearings. And if the press leaks and reporting are true, the decision was made to punt on that, that there was some worry that if they were to go ahead and announce it was their intention to make criminal referrals prior to the hearings, that the hearings would have less credibility. So they seem to be sitting on that decision for a while, perhaps seeing how these hearings go, and then they're going to go from there. But there's a couple of problems. First of all, I think, I mean, I guess there's two issues to look at here. One is, is that generally a very good idea? And I think you can make a really strong claim that whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, whether this is Donald Trump or somebody else, that having a situation in which successive or follow-on successor administrations start prosecuting prior administrations and presidents from prior administrations is dangerous territory. It looks a little bit like banana republic politics, the kind that you would find in far less stable countries, um, and sets a very terrible precedent going down the road. Because as we all know, once someone sets the bar a little lower in Washington, it's a race to see just how far the bar can go. We already are hearing having Republicans 
Republicans having discussions about how if they were to take back over the House, they want to move to impeach President Biden. You know, there was a day when impeachment was considered a very serious, very grave thing. I think Democrats blew that up a little bit with their first impeachment of the whole kind of okey Ukrainian issue. But here we go. And so I think there's that. Then there's the secondary question of whether or not the evidence that they would send forward to Merrick Garland is a basis for a prosecution is really something that is strong enough to hold up in court. In an actual court of law, you would be getting an adversarial process. And there's a lot probably here that's not coming out that would matter deeply to questions of whether or not when you're trying to decide if someone actually broke a law. And maybe there's a distinction between the evidence on President Trump and the evidence for any of his advisors who may be in some legal jeopardy. But one thing that is notable to me is the committee keeps saying that it has shown that President Trump knew his claims about the election being stolen were false. And then it keeps calling witnesses who say, President Trump, it seemed like he really believed in this stuff. Let's listen to a clip from Thursday of Deputy Attorney General Richard Donoghue. The president throughout all of these meetings and telephone conversations was adamant that he had won and that we were not doing our job. Um, But it did escalate over time until ultimately the, the meeting on January 3rd, which was sort of the most extreme of the meetings and conversations. And after that January 3rd meeting, the deputy attorney general testified that that evening, President Trump called him on his personal cell phone and raised a question about a truck supposedly full of shredded ballots in Georgia that was in the custody of an ICE agent. So that was three days before the Capitol riot. And President Trump is still calling the Justice Department officials with these wild claims. One other thing I thought was notable from that meeting and really telling was Mr. Donoghue said in one conversation with the president, he was jotting some notes down and he jotted this quote from President Trump. You guys may not be following the Internet the way I do, unquote, which is telling to me, Manet, it suggests that President Trump was reading all sorts of conspiratorial stuff on social media, on the Internet, and believing that it was true, calling his deputy attorney general on his personal cell phone about it. Well, I really think that Trumpology, frankly, is extremely difficult and perplexing science. If any of us claim to understand exactly what Trump believes based on what he says at any given time, we certainly could have written a best-selling book about it because that's exactly what the American public has been wondering for the past five or six years, and it's all come to a head surrounding January 6th. I can definitely believe a narrative wherein Donald Trump is getting all these little pieces of information that the election was stolen and truly believing them and is pressing his associates and others in the Republican Party around the country to try to find evidence for that and to try to challenge the election results based on a true belief of all these things. But I think you could also have a more cynical interpretation wherein he knows that the election probably wasn't stolen. Maybe he thinks there was a little bit of foul play here and there, and he is just clinging on to these little pieces of information that are being generated that seem to provide fleeting evidence of foul play by the Democrats and is pushing people to try to spin them into something bigger, despite knowing that they probably don't add up to an election loss. So frankly, I don't know which one of those things is true. But you're right to point out that Trump's standing uh, in terms of whether he's going to face a criminal charge does depend in part on the answer. And so hopefully the January 6th committee, at the very least, will provide a little bit more firm insight, something that could show very clearly whether or not Trump thought these election fraud claims were true and whether he actually was involved in any kind of overt criminal conspiracy. The other audience, it seems to me, is the general public and specifically Republican voters. And there's been some polling on who's watching these hearings. Here's a morning consult political poll that is written up in the New York Post. 62% of Americans say they did not watch the panel's second and third hearings. 58% say they have not heard or read about them. And there is a partisan breakdown in this, as you would expect. The poll also found 57% of Democrats watched in full or in part compared with 32% of independents and 25% of Republicans. And 25% of Republicans, Kim, is still a quarter of Republicans. And particularly if President Trump wants to make another run for this in 2024, a quarter of Republicans is a big deal. And there's been some polling, too, also 
in New Hampshire now. There's a poll showing you ask likely Republican primary voters, who do you want to be your presidential nominee in 2024? 37 percent say Mr. Trump and 39 percent say Republican governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis. And that's inside the margin of error. But, Kim, do you think that figures like that suggest that some of this information is breaking through? And even if people don't think that it rises to the level of prosecuting President Trump or his aides, maybe they think about it at the level of thinking twice about making that primary vote for President Trump. Maybe. Although, to put this in perspective, and having been on the ground through the 2016 campaign, do bear in mind that Donald Trump managed to win that nomination without ever really breaking much more than about 35 or 40 percent of the electorate. He just managed to rack up the necessary votes that he needed in the end to win. And he then rallied the rest of the party behind him. I mean, I still remember being at the Republican convention where there were never Trumpers who were organizing efforts there. It lasted for a day or two to try to stage a last minute sort of groundswell of support at the convention for an alternate candidate. And then he managed to convince people to go random. Now, I do think that to do that again would be harder in light of January 6th. There might be some people who'd be willing to once again support the Republican nominee because they were so concerned about Joe Biden and continued governance of Democrats. I think the problem Donald Trump does have, which goes to your point, which is that there feels as though there has been a hardening of a certain percentage of the Republican electorate or potential Republican electorate that would no longer now give him that chance because they felt that happened already and they weren't happy with the outcome. And that is a real problem for him. I think, look, there are other things about Donald Trump, too. He's we've been talking a lot about Joe Biden's age. Donald Trump is also getting up there in age. He himself has mentioned that that is a a big thing that he would think about as he factored and whether he'd do another run. So there's that. And just I think a lot of people and this probably says something about these January 6 polling numbers and how many people are doing this. They want to look forward. They're tired of looking back. And guys like Ron DeSantis or other Republicans to them are the future. And and some people are getting tired of relitigating all of this stuff. Thank you, Kim and Manet. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. And we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.